All right. Well, hi, Travis. So here we are. You know, it's it, it's one thing about this Corona thing is um, I don't think you and I would be doing sauna talk right now if if we didn't have this lockdown and this Corona because uh, you're out in the Northwest and I'm in Minnesota. So we're letting this thing work in our favor. Um, we got technology on our side. So welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, the conditions have allowed us to communicate. Right, right. It's crazy. And you're outside. And for um, listeners and watchers to Sauna Talk, um, give us a little story. Where are you and who is to your left? <laughs> well, I got my dog here. His name's Pi. And uh, he actually has a, a bit of a leg injury today, but um, that's why he's hanging out with me here so patiently. <laughs> But um, I got Pi here with me, and um, we are in, right now, we're in Bellingham, Washington, which is up all the way by the border, right by mm -hmm. British Columbia. Yeah, right. And, and are you by the water? I am, yeah. I'm living right next to the water, right by Bellingham Bay, um, wow. right by a beach called Locust Beach. Wow. How far away is the beach from where you're sitting right now? It's uh, about a five-minute 10 minute bike ride. It's funny you should say bike ride. I have a good buddy. Um, he's actually a coach on the Minnesota Wild hockey team, and all his neighbors know him well because uh, he lives across the street from Lake Minnetonka, which is a, a big lake in the western suburbs. And when he's done with sauna, a sauna round, um, he hops on his bicycle and, and goes about a block or, you know, maybe 10 houses down where there's a public beach. And he's in his bathing suit and all that, and it, he gets off his bike and cold plunge he goes. But you're not quite, you're not that, you're not accessible for between sauna rounds from where you're sitting. Not quite, no. I have a canoe actually that I fill with water. Oh, so, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's kind of the opposite use of the canoe, but it works wonderfully because it's like body length and deep enough to, to cold plunge in. You, you know, Travis, I have heard about many cold plunge devices and things, but that one you got me on. Now, that's so <laughs> awesome. That is so great. It um, goes with the nautical theme, too. The nautical theme. And, and let's, let's dive into that just a little bit in terms sure. of um, you have a lot of themes in, in, your, in your life and in, in your creativity. Um, are you known for sauna building or is it a spoke of your overall wheel or, or how, how is that? Um, I just, well, I started sauning in, in 2010 um, where I lived in Olympia, Washington. And there was a group of other builders who met once a month at a guy named Tibor Brewers. And um, they did a sweat, an all men's sweat. And it was a time kind of a, it was a Lakota style traditional sweat, which is um, a ceremony and each round is to a different direction. So that was how I um, got introduced to sauna. And it just was something that really resonated with me right away. Um, and I recognized how wonderful it was to have access to this uh, monthly event. And um, that was kind of what, got me my wheels turning about what saunas were and then um i started you know throughout my life i got influenced by different saunas and i as a builder it was something i had always been interested in and i think one of the things that interests me most about it is just the inclusion of all these natural elements in the building right it's because you're building for steam and water and stone and fire and um, at least in the style saunas that you and I like. Right on, um, right on. So the, all of these elements come into play for your for, for building, but you, you, you know, you have this, you know, getting back to the canoe and using that as a cold plunge and stuff, you, you, you I'm, I, I know from your work that you have a very unique uh, sense of adaptation of different elements um, and kind of bringing, bringing them forward. And, you know, I thought we could dive right into that. Uh, the number four ring comes to mind. Um, is it true that we're, we're talking about four specific sauna builds uh, in your feature? And I know uh, on Sauna Times, we have featured two of your unique builds. And you know, I could speak to the anglerfish sauna, yeah, the snail shell, shell sauna. Um, do you want to take us through the whole uh, project, or I could say 
the portfolio of projects just uh, by name, and we can dive into each of them if, if you want to get right into that. Sure, yeah, I'll give you a brief overview of the ones that kind of got the ball rolling. The, mm -hmm. the snail shell sauna was kind of one of the first ones that I had friends who wanted a sauna built, and I kind of proposed to them that I would do it in um, a really creative way, in a way of taking the building into a sculpture. And they were really interested and um, had hosted me for a number of years in an old barn with my metal shop. So I did a lot of the work in trade for um, the space that I used. Um, so anyway, that's how the snail shell sun started was some friends wanted a sauna built and right. it became a kind of a collaborative effort with a bunch of people helping in the community mm -hmm. in Olympia, Washington. Right on. And, and um, getting into the weeds about that one, I thought maybe it would be nice if we could take them one, one by one. Uh, and I'll certainly put in the show notes the link to um, that project uh, uh, with the article that we did on Sauna Times, but how big is it? And can you kind of walk us through um, the, the, the build a little bit, but more the end product? Um, you know, how, how big is it? What sort of elements did you introduce in terms of materials and how did you go about making this unique structure? Well, well, that one is a, a yurt. So it's a circular building, but instead of doing it as a circle, I um, made the roof spiral out. Um, it's on the Fibonacci sequence and it creates like a snail shell where it's a uh, spiral and where the spiral comes off of the circle is the entrance. And there's a an entrance way where you can stop and take your clothes off and put your towel on. And yeah. then there's a door that goes into the actual sauna. Um, and it's a 10 foot circle. It's nine sided and nonagon. Mm -hmm. And then each wall is canted, which means that none of the walls are vertical. They mm -hmm. splay out um, at a, a low angle. And that allows the walls to function as the backrest. And it also keeps the walls really well protected um, from, the, from water splashback, which is mm -hmm. like one of the biggest issues in the Northwest. Right on. And where's the um, stove located? The stove on that one is actually located inside. It, of the sweat um, and then there's a stone sculpture built around the wood stove that you yeah. pour wa water onto right right so the foundation or uh, that's not the right word i guess the the base for this is a uh, a, a, a yurt about nine foot in diameter was was sort of the ten canvas foot at the base yeah got it so that was and there is a concrete slab too Right on. And so that's what you started with. You figured, okay, here's a, here's a yurt and uh, I can build this yurt. And then, and then you worked off of that. Yeah. I used this, the uh, style of construction of a uh, concentric ring yurt. Nice. And it was he heavily influenced by a builder from Maine. His name is William Copperthwaite. Um, and I learned a lot about yurts from his work. And he kind of brought yurts to America um, mm -hmm. in the 60s from um, kind of um, a cultural adaptation of the Mongolian yurt. Beautiful, beautiful. And is that sauna still in operation? And how far is it from, from where you are? And, and is it still being used? Yeah, that one is still in operation. And it gets used during the winter uh, for, you know, for a sauna. And then in the summertime, it actually gets used as a guest house a lot. Beautiful. Um, which is really nice of that stacking functions that saunas offer in a lot of places. Um, and it's just a really nice building. As soon as you walk in, the, the aroma of the Western red cedar just really takes over. And it's all yeah. live edge. And it feels like you're inside of a tree when you're inside of that one, because it's yeah. round. Right. Wonderful. Can we go to number two? Yeah, the, the next one that I did um, was a, a collaboration with another builder who lived down in Portland, Oregon. And um, his name is Mark Goodson, and he has a company called Engaging Environments. And um, he was just a friend of a friend that I met that was a really talented builder. And he came up and saw the uh, snail shell sauna. And he said, hey, I have an idea about a sauna that I want to build, which had this curved roof. And that allowed to push the uh, steam, it curves and then goes straight to where the bench is. Mm. So it kind of directs the steam towards the people who are sitting in the room. 
Um, and we call that one the steamroller. Right on. Um, so that was the next one that I built in Portland, Oregon. And that has a really unique shape, a canted wall that acts as the, uh, the backrest again. And then underneath of the seating is all wood storage. Mm -hmm. um, that stove is an outside load. And um, we had a stove builder from Portland build that stove. So it was like a custom sauna stove that had a cage around it with mm -hmm. stones. Mm -hmm. So um, how many times have you saunaed in, in the steamroller sauna? Actually quite a bit. Um, we built it and then oddly enough, um, it ended up getting stored at my other really good friend's place. And um, it was there for about two years. So every time when I'd go down to Portland, I could go and use the sauna and visit my friend Tyler Smith. Um, I would stop and get to a chance to reconnect with that one. And a lot of people in Portland got to use that sauna. That's a, it's a really great, great building. Wow, that sounds great. Um, is there, is it hot room only? Is there a changing room? And what sort of dimensions internally in, in the hot room itself? You know, that one's really small a uh, floor layout because you walk in the door and then to the right, th there's the tiered seating mm -hmm. and the wall kicks out in that direction. Um, the, the actual floor space in that sauna is only about six feet by eight feet deep. And then the rest of it is all bench. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a double, a two tiered bench on one side and the, the wood stove is, is um, facing, you're kind of facing the wood stove when you're seated. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you know, I, I wrote an article about, you know, we have in America, we have big cheeseburgers, big cars, uh, but we don't have to build big saunas. And, you know, I, I back people down off the cliff almost daily about uh, getting them to rethink the size of their hot room and uh, I think 6'8 or 7'7, seven, 6'8 seven, is really a sweet spot in terms of the cube um, and the ability actually, the ironic ability to serve or to heat a lot of people. Because as you know, with good heat, uh, your hot round session, what is it, 10, 15 minutes? Um, right. And your climate out there in the Northwest, I mean, hanging out outside uh, is not a big thing. So the idea of cycling through this sauna sounds really quite ideal. Uh, I think it's well, it's well cubed, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the more I work with saunas, I like them smaller and smaller. I love to just utilize heat and, um, and have that real hot heat. Um, that one had an awesome thermometer in it and it was great when it would get up to 200, 210 mm -hmm. and you can just see everyone in there uh, slumping down, you know, yeah. trying to get it, the, the top bench is just gets harder and harder to climb. <laughs> right on, right on. I know. But you know, where, where else do we get that level of intensity, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, I, I call that like the rubber band theory of sauna, where you're really actualizing these temperature extremes before you enter your water filled canoe, you know, you have this like really intense heat and, um, you know, that's, that's part of the dynamic in the, in, and the greatness of sauna uh, and it sounds like this sauna is very fulfilling and there's probably never a need to reach for a spring jacket while sitting on the bench no definitely not yeah <laughs> right on brother okay so that's number two anything else to the uh, the steamroller it so sounds fabulous that's still in operation still in Portland it's it actually moved it's not in Portland anymore it's outside of Portland on the, the Washington side of the Columbia River and um, it's at some a friend, another friend's farm down there. They make uh, mead, um, so they they are hosting that sauna right now, which is cool. It's uh, you know it's small enough that it can be loaded on skids and and moved around. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So that's where that one is. And then after that, um, I started working on the the anglerfish sauna, um, which has been a big project for me. And that was really when I started this organization called the Hundred Handed Ones. And um, the reason I started that is um, I started working with another artist and um, we decided that we wanted to make more of an architectural uh, organization that represented just more than one artist. Because the more that you work on buildings, <clears throat> there's just so many different people that work on it. Um, there's, you know, there's so many different expertises. 
And I really love about architecture is it brings together all these different groups of people and um, has a larger purpose in mind. And the anglerfish sauna really did that for me um, was working with a team. And so um, another artist that I met uh, did sheet metal work and his name is Travis Kahn. Um, we share the same first name, oddly enough. And um, <clears throat> he's an art teacher. He taught high school art and he is an extremely talented armor smith. Um, mm. he, he makes masks and armor. And when I saw what he was doing with sheet metal, I, I thought there was a really big opportunity to use his skill sets toward architecture. Um, so we decided to make an organization and we um, referenced this ancient Greek story of the hundred handed ones. Mm. Um, so and, and tell us about that story uh, briefly, if you don't mind, Travis, that, and, and the connection. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, it's a, you know, I love these ancient stories that connect uh, present day with the human, humanity of the past. And um, this story was uh, a really old story is that before humans were ever around in ancient Greek and Roman tales, there was these titans. And two of the titans, one was uh, the earth and one was the sky. And they had children. And the first three children that they had were called the hundred handed ones. And they were kind of like uh, a mistake um, for the parents. It was, you know, their first time making children and they didn't turn out quite as they planned. And these uh, beings ended up having 50 heads and a hundred arms. And they were kind of treacherous beasts. And their father, the, the sky was really ashamed of them. So he trapped them in this, the pits of Tartarus. And uh, while they were trapped for ages, they developed skills with their hands that um, to take up the time and to just use uh, the opportunities that they had. And they became the, some of the greatest makers that ever lived. Hmm. And then Zeus, in order to overthrow his father, Cronus, he came to the hundred handed ones and he said, if you make me what I need to defeat my father, I'll let you out of these pits. And the hundred handed ones made Zeus his first bolt of lightning. And that's what gave Zeus the power to overthrow his father. So there are these pivotal players of makers that are really uh, not recognized in the story, but without them, uh, Zeus could never arise to um, to defeat his father. That's so we, we decided to reference this story of the difficulties um, in order to, to push each other to work to something better than oneself. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that's my little uh, Greek story for you for the day. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And, and it fed into this collaborative um, team of Travis, the iron worker, you, the Travis, we call you the builder, like the, the, the builder guy, like the, the wood, you know, is that your expertise per se? Is that your medium of, of? Yeah, I actually, well, I do multimedia. That's my favorite thing about architecture. Um, and I have a blacksmithing forge here. So I love to bend metal and hammer metal. And then I also do a lot of woodworking and wood mm -hmm. sculpture, but everything is very hand driven. I don't use excessive amounts of power tools with any of the work that I do. I, of course, use some power tools, but um, most of the work that I do is done with very simple, old tools. And that's kind of where, where I come from. And also where Travis Kahn, he is a sheet metal smith and really a metal historian. Mm -hmm. And he studied armor and the way that they make um, metal helmets throughout all of history. Um, so he learned all these different techniques that are, are very simple with simple tools, but they don't rely heavily on computer um, aid. Mm. And I think that's what really uh, makes us stand out with our work is that we do nothing on computers. There is, everything is done with a pencil and a paper on design and then with usually a hammer and a tool um, in application. And that's where our artwork comes from is the process and making the process instead of having high powered tools with terrible amounts of dust and hurt your mm -hmm. ears. 
Mm. We work in a pleasant environment that utilizes simple tools. Um, and also it's a very much re related to a relationship the artist has with a material and right utilizing on. the material to its, its uh, the best of its ability, the assets that it has, just like the way that I bent the wood in the anglerfish sauna. The cedar as the material, it created the shape of the building because of the way it bends. Mm. And we utilize the bend of the material to create a design instead of forcing a design on a material. So it's, I think that's fundamentally what makes it different and why I wanted to start the organization, the 100 Handed Ones, was to celebrate a hand and craft oriented design. Beautiful. Wow, thank you for that. And and what a what a pleasant thing to be working with the material with with your hands and you know accepting the grain, accepting the you, you, the shape of the shape you're creating. I mean, you're you're basically sculpting these these material using these materials. You're a sculptor. Exactly. And the anglerfish sauna was our opportunity to take a building and turn it into a sculpture. Mm. And so. We wanted to make art as an experience. And the reason that we use sauna is because sauna is um, a cultural practice that is extremely relevant to right now. The, you know, it, it, in that interview that you had with Mikkel Olland, he said something that resonated so heavily with me that I wanted to reference, but he said that the sauna is the womb of mother earth herself. And I could not believe hearing those words after we had built what we built because that was exactly what we were going for was a center of rebirth for the person to step inside of in a foreign environment that is guided through the natural world and identify with something that is not based on their ego identity their material mask and the actual act that literally encourages the audience to remove their material layer is really, really symbolic. And that's why this sculpture is unique um, mm -hmm. and why I'm, I'm working on making this book right now mm, about beautiful. building this sculpture. Yeah, man, well, well done. let's talk about the book. And, and before we do that, we'll stay in the, in there, there's a fourth sauna within the book. Is that right? Is, there, is it four? No, you know, actually, I'm sorry that, yeah, I, I wanted to clarify. I actually decided to, when I first started the book idea, I was planning on using all the saunas that I built, but I went back and I really realized that I wanted to center the book only on the anglerfish sauna. I spent a year and a half on one project and I had 2,200 photos of this, this project. Um, and really the book, I wanted to show the reader the process of how this thing was built. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to engage the process with the reader is because I want children and kids to see things are possible. Like, you know, I've seen a lot of building books. I, I look at them all the time. And usually you see a finished product with a couple people standing next to it with a big smile on their face. And it's wonderful, but it doesn't show the guts, the how it was actually made. And, and connecting the audience with that process has always been what has driven me and what I've always sought out in artwork is mm -hmm. exactly what happened. But there's another side to the book that I think is really important. It's not just about process. It is what you mentioned at the beginning, the coronavirus, is that I think that this event is potentially has, can have a stimulus for preventative and health conscious lifestyle. And, and that's what sauna represents, is it's how we can boost our immune systems through the teachers of cold and hot to allow our immune systems to be able to handle these things in these stressed out environments, especially in the winter when viruses are gonna be rampant. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to focus this bit of media during this time to, to make it about something that has the ability to heal people and increase their immune systems at a time when we really need to think about that. Beautiful. So really, it's a, it's a double dose. I mean, it's the process, and it's the process making something um, that is actually very good for us. It's health and a, and a health 
environment. And yeah, you bring up something else, you know, with the, with the hot and the cold, uh, you know, it's, it's quite obvious to you and I, but, you know, we have developed as humans to live in a very um, uh, narrow range of temperature. And, and this is part of a lot of, a lot of the elements of the Wim Hof method and this whole thermogenesis thing. And, uh, you know, sauna is just a great gateway to experience the extremes of, of hot and cold. And, you know, then we, then we uh, open up the doors to the, the whole wellness aspect of, uh, you know, strengthening our immune system and cardiovascular and, you know, the, this whole rainbow of, of, of wellness. So, so, you know, your, your book has this dual, dual meaning, it sounds like, like a, like a dual uh, lesson, you, you know, you mentioned for young people, but for all of us, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about it more as like a children's book for adults. Beautiful. Um, it's a photographic story about how something was made and why it was made. Mm -hmm. um, every time, you know, people see the sauna, they just ask two questions. They are in wonder, you know, and they say, why did you do this? And what inspired you? And after so many times of hearing those two questions, I decided I'm going to show them in a visual way to create media that um, stimulates people to do what's potential to to um, to reference the better parts. Yeah. Um, yes. And lovely. You know what? It, yeah. So so what is the book writing process like for you, Travis? I, it's been great. Is I actually went to graduate school, um, so I spent a lot of time reading um, and writing throughout my academic career. So it really puts me back in that academic role. And I have just been reading so much. I, I've been reading Mikel Allen's book, Sweat, which has been terrific. All of the historical significance is just so good. It resonates so well with me. Um, it's been a real pleasure to read. It's too bad that it's so difficult to get a print version of that book, but he has made it available on his website. Um, so you can read it for free is how I've been doing it. And I've just been, I love that book. Um, the other book that's been, I've been reading is, I just finished was David Byrne's book. Mm. It's called How Music Works. Yeah, man. And again, this was one of those process oriented books directed for people to see how this thing was made to introduce the audience to the process and to not um, separate the artists from the standard or everyday person is that we want to incorporate this in everyone's lives to allow people to, you know, follow what gives them fulfillment with their actions. Um, and, the, and the, again, the other book that I've been reading and, and it's really philosophically based was this book called The Power of Nonviolence. And it was written in 1934 by a guy named Richard Gregg. And it has been a terrific book that explains a lot of the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. Because um, this guy went in the 20s and actually lived with Gandhi, came back and wrote this book. And this book was really important in the civil rights movement in the United States in the 60s. Um, and Martin Luther King Jr. was in contact with Richard Gregg about this publication. So I thought in the times as they are, it was good to go back and read um, something that was philosophically resonant to the time. Um, so I've been kind of jumping around on books and time periods and just thinking a lot about how to um, tell a story. Yeah. Um, and then along with reading a lot, I've been writing a ton. I spend three to four hours a day in my house and I just write on paper. I don't spend time on the computer as much. I like to get my ideas out by hand on a sketch pad and then go back in the evening time and I'll process it. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's kind of the percolation period is when I transfer it from the handwritten form into the um, text in, in a computer. So, um, so Travis, if, if I had to bet, I was going to bet that you were handwriting <laughs> based <yeah. laughs> on your story about using hand tools. You, you're a very tactile individual. And so I, I imagine you sitting there over coffee in the morning and, and what, what, a, what a therapeutic process where you can get your ideas on paper using your hand and, and the actual manual writing. And then, yeah, and then, you know, you kind of jump into putting it in digital form later. Is right. And then I go out and do a song.
Anna and I think about it and process, you know, yeah. and then I come in the morning and drink the coffee and get typing or writing by hand and yeah. then to typing. I've been doing a lot of photo editing. Um, so that's been, and then the other thing I do a lot since I have, I'm home is I've been baking all the time. Mm-hmm. I've been uh, doing sourdough breads and it was great. Actually, recently, I'm so glad to tell you this. Um, me and my buddy decided that we would try using a sauna to bake bread. And so while it was heating, we fermented the dough in the higher temperature environment, which worked terrifically. And then at the end, all the coals, we just put a cast iron right into the stove and baked the bread in the sauna stove. That's wonderful. Yeah, so that so was one of those out? stacking. It worked wonderfully, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one of those stacking function things that people a long time ago would have done because Mm -hmm. they would have tried to utilize the resources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just connects you, I think, with that human history, again, is just playing with bread. It's that simple, but, you know, it's also just, there's so much there. Right on. That's really cool. Um, couple things so on the writing front i i hear you i i have a clipboard in my changing room and i can't tell you how often i i jot stuff down and as you can relate you know one of the wonderful things about sauna and and i've been taking pretty much nothing but solo saunas lately um since i've been up at our island cabin and all that i mean you have a lot of time with yourself and and you know sitting on the sauna bench I don't know what a lot of people think about, but boy, my mind goes all over the place. And then, you know, you're sitting there for 15 <laughs> minutes. And then, then when you, I don't know about you, but when I leave the hot room and a cold plunge, I'm like, I got to remember this. I got to remember that. I got, so I got these, all these fragments written down. And then I bring in like this, this wet, you know, a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with all of these elements. And I set it on my desk inside and then say, I'll get that. I'll get to that later. And then, you know, usually the next morning I look at it and I'm, I'm half of it is like, what the hell was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but some of it works, you know, and that, that's the numbers game, you know, like, like when you think about all kinds of great creative minds, it's, um, it's, it's not the stuff that ended up in the garbage pile, but you need a lot of stuff in the garbage pile for the good things to percolate to the top. Yeah, I think about it as play. You have to take time to play and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And that's just that relationship I talk about with material Mm -hmm. is that if you get too serious about your media and you never take time to play, you don't grow and develop as a craftsperson. You can do the same thing over and over and over again, but you don't have a story or a progression. Or an identity to the product. So thank right. you for that. I, I've been grappling with this. Uh, you know, as you know, I help a lot of people build saunas. And there's this sort of like um, confluence that's happening with builders by trade uh, getting into the sauna business, or they say they have been in the sauna business for a long time. And they're applying a very mechanized approach to something that you and I um, relate to more as art. And, and I'm so grateful and happy to have this conversation with you because you're grounding me back to um, a place, of, of one, you know, one of the key things that I love about sauna building is it, it really is a creative um, uh, process. And it's not one of these um, things that's reduced to, um, you know, just very simple instructions. And, and that's why when I wrote the book on how to build a sauna, I, I really try to offer places for creativity and individu- individuality to come forward instead of this, here's how you do it, here's what you need, here's your building materials list, here's your dimensions. Uh, anybody can do that. And, and I, I want to really um, emphasize and get back, Matt, more to the creative side of sauna building. So for that, I want to thank you for, for, for bringing that forward in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your compliment. Yeah, right, right. So let's talk a little bit more about um, up, any upcoming sauna uh, build projects for you and have you built any saunas lately? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, recently, um, I had a friend come uh, that had an old horse trailer 
and I converted the horse trailer into a sauna just a couple weeks ago and that was a really wonderful build. Um, just on the outside it looks like an old horse trailer with uh, uh, pipes sticking out of it and on the inside it's a really nice cedar sauna with all brass details mm -hmm. and then there's a tub in it and the bench is over the tub and this one's awesome because it's a dual purpose summertime is that in the summertime you can open the two rear doors where the horses used to go in and then have a, a hot bath anywhere and in the winter time you close everything up and you got an awesome sauna nice so you and have how, this how is this heated and how did you treat these um uh you know non non-linear non-flat panels that are in a horse trailer well yeah i you know the nice part about sheet metal is that on one plane it bends really really well um you can't bend it in all three dimensions but on one dimension it folds really easily and so what I did for all the curves was I cut pieces of sheet metal and bent them, but then shingle overlapped them to take the curves and then riveted the pieces together. And on each of the curves, I just used sheet metal because it bent and fit into that curve space really easily. And then on all the flat planes, I just used tongue and groove cedar. Nice. So this is a multimedia interior walled hot room? Yeah, it is. And um yep something tells me david byrne would like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> i always try to bring as many media in as i can i especially love stained glass i think stained glass is one of those medias that it's you know light that is colored and it envelopes you and it changes the space and most of the time i'm sauntering at night but if you can get stained glass into it, the snail shell sauna has a wonderful piece of stained glass in the window. And even on some full moon nights, uh, just the moonlight through beautiful. that window is just yeah, right really on. You know, the space. Right, right, right. You know, I mean that uh, that we call uh, well, what's called the candle window is 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 quite a significant thing in in the history. You know, like if you go way back into sauna building, you know, even when you consider until recently that you know saunas were built without electricity and stuff so so this like window element in sauna has always been something sort of important but also again a signature element opportunity and you've definitely taken that up a notch by utilizing stained glass and um yeah i i would have to say that you know in 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 your it, well there's there's in both the angler fish sauna and the snail shell sauna there's um it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you have stained glass in both, right? Well, at, you know, actually I have blown glass in the anglerfish sauna, and that was especially cool because I got to go to a place in Centralia um, that does blown glass, and I had an artist blow the actual plates mm -hmm. and infuse the color into the plates. We made them extra thick, and those are the domed eyes in the anglerfish sauna is blown glass. Yeah, right on. Okay, cool. So. Um, where do you live now? Like, are you living in a house or you're, you're in Olympia? Is it, uh, something tells me tiny house is, is your, is your mode. Am I? <laughs> well, you... yeah, that's the funny thing. I lived in Olympia for quite a while, but I've been out of Olympia for a couple of years now and I'm living up in Bellingham, Washington that's right. now. Gotcha. And yeah, I have a little tiny house and I live in the backyard of a older woman um, named Rebecca Snodgrass. She's a really wonderful lady and she has MS. Um, so she has a lot of issues with her joints and um, I'm living in the backyard and I got my sauna back here and we're just five minutes from the beach and we, I can help her um, with certain things. And then it's, uh, you know, advantageous for me to have a nice place to live for a reasonable rent. Beautiful. Um, and does she sauna? You know, uh, she might, she would, um, but right now during coronavirus, um, she hasn't been wanting to be in um, in contact right now. It's Completely a, understandable. I, I, yeah, especially yeah. with the immune system compromise situation. Um, so she hasn't been sunning, um, but I have made it available. Mm-hmm. No, I, I get that. Like here in Minneapolis, what's emerging, you know, through this, and, and I mean, my son was a perfect example. I mean, before all this stuff and for 
many years, uh, I'm talking almost 20 years in my backyard, Minneapolis sauna, uh, you know, I sort of fell into these sauna um, time slots. And a lot of my pals, a lot of my buddies would know, like Friday happy hour has always been a sauna time for me. And so I would sort of cast some invites out and it, it was always a sauna party with a variable, you know, guest list. You know, some would show, some wouldn't show. But it was always sort of like this free form gathering, you know. And uh, anyway, a, as you well know, with the corona, that none of this is happening. And, you know, we're all right. respecting this, you know, this, this self-quarantine stuff. And I've been, as I mentioned earlier, so it's like yourself. I mean, it's a lot of solo sauna time. But what we've been doing is this, like, sauna sauna i guess you could call it cycling where what i'll do is um as my uh, well when i know i'm going to sauna I'll, I'll send an invite out to a friend or a friend and his wife or whatever and then as i'm finishing my sauna like close to 7 p.m if i start at 5 they know i'm going to be uh, out of there at 6 37 and i toss a log on and they have a great sauna so you know it, it, i love this term that you use about the stacking function and um i think this is kind of really where a lot of people are, are are going with their backyard saunas is the stacking function of using the heat through multiple sessions with multiple guests under their own uh, isolated bubble. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's great. So you can relate, huh? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I can totally relate. I, I have the same thing just because I live um, there's other people who live at the same property uh, little cabins so once it's fired and I have my rounds or whoever anyone can use it um, and that's kind of one of the things is that the sauna becomes one of the center parts of a community and that's why it's so uh, has the potential to, to have such a wonderful effect is that it's good for your immune system but it's also really good for people to um to interact with one another or have their own personal space too Beautiful. Um, and i think it's that stacking functions of like it does all of these things and all of them are good for for people really. right on brother well said thank you let's talk about sauna design for a moment um yeah what are your favorite design elements i mean you alluded to stained glass as a very unique um element uh what else comes to mind for you well, one, a couple of things, because I've listened to some of the other guests that you've had, and um, I, I, one of the things that I really liked that in the Native American sweat, they incorporate a real low door. And I read about this before I built my sauna, and it was um, so that everyone had to bow their head before entering. Hmm. And I thought that was a really wonderful idea and something that I never saw. Like everything in uh, Western architecture is based so that, you know, you would never have to lower your head. And that's why I wanted to incorporate something that was the antithesis of what you've seen, but has kind of a, a important, uh, and it also saves heat too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, I, yeah, I was, uh, where was I? Was I, was I walking? Was I on a bike ride in anticipation of our chat? I really wanted to lean into, thank you for bringing that up. I wanted to lean into something about form and function. And, and again, I deal with a lot of people building saunas and in, in this sort of like spectrum, <clears throat> like it's way over on the function side, predominantly. I mean, people are into a very a, a practical build that does the job you know, like optimizing or minimizing the amount of cedar and maximizing the amount of space. I mean, a very functional build. And, you know, there's, there's grace in that. I mean, there, there's a lot of great purpose in that. But I, I have to say, in all the people that I've collaborated with and known uh, with regard to sauna build, uh, you really strike me as somebody who's way over on the other side, and, and I, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit about the balance that you apply between form, uh, the design, uh, the creativity, and then the practical, the function, um, the nuts and bolts. Um, what comes to mind with that? Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I really think that function has to drive every project. You know, the thing has to work. Um, it serves a purpose and if it doesn't work well, then it's not going to last. So everything always has to first serve a function. Um, but when you miss out on an opportunity for design, um, 
sometimes you just forego something that can really affect you in a way that you don't consider is you know i live in a handmade home um, that i built and it has a really profound effect on your everyday life mm. is that when you're sitting you don't think about the fact that all of these small things around you have a story and um a part of your history and really they become a part of you and um i think that when you only focus on efficiency of material and you don't think about the the idea that you're going to use this thing all the time it's going to be a part of you um then you don't think about some of the opportunities there are that will take more time and it took me a while to learn how to build things that weren't flat um, and square and you know i come from more of learning about from boats um, and this is where you see the highest level of woodworking a lot of times is in this marine architecture I and mean, you get to see curves that, that serve a function um, but they they really have a profound effect on you when you step into a round room it makes you feel differently um, and i wanted this sauna to be a womb environment a, a womb of the earth and in order to accomplish that it couldn't just be a flat walls um, nature doesn't have flat surfaces in most ways and for me, I really just find inspiration from the natural things that are around us. And my favorite builders have always referenced nature in a way that um, sometimes takes a little bit more time, but when you pay attention to the line, it um, can cause you to create something that has really a resounding effect on the users. Um, if, any person that steps inside of the angler fish sauna remembers it that it's just um a remarkable space and it represents the materials in a way that resonates with everyone and i'm really proud and and uh grateful that i've had the opportunity to experiment enough to learn about things so that i can um bring them together in this multimedia uh forum and and that's really um why i'm hoping to make this book is to share some of the inspiration that comes to make something outside of what is just the most efficient way beautiful yeah man thank you excellent well said travis and um i was almost not going to even ask this question because you probably get asked this a million times but why angler fish is there is there a deeper meaning to that or is it just a fish that you like as a species um what's behind the angler fish specifically it's very much form based it, you know the shape of the fish was this um round but not sleek it's kind of chunky the fish so it fit what I needed. Again, I wasn't forcing form onto what I wanted, but finding what ha exists and then referencing it for its beauty. Um, so it's all about a uh, connection to, to how to get where you want to go and then what is the best way to do it. And for us, we, you know, we just sat around and drew pictures for a long time and the fish was the form that, that was what we wanted to represent and the angler fish was the fish that best represented what we needed um, in order to accomplish it also the lantern of the bioluminescent lantern of the angler fish is tremendous and mm. every time i've seen it it's just sticks in my memory and i have six-year-olds that walk off the street and know immediately that it's an angler fish and of all my critics the six to seven year old range is who i really listen to because if you can hold a six-year-old's attention you know you have something good and i have six-year-olds that just come out of the woodwork to tell me about my angler fish and i <laughs> love i love to listen to that critic that is the critic we need thank you beautiful if you could have a mobile sauna and bring it anywhere in the world travis what's the what's the first place that comes to mind for you well, I thought about it. Um, 
the, I really love going up to the mountains, you know, um, and there's an, a mountain right by us, uh, Sauk Mountain. It's um, on the way out uh, on Highway 20 out to the Cascades, and there's a wonderful lake up there, Sauk Lake, and, and I don't know how, you would have to fly Asana in <laughs> to get it up there, but I would, I would love to do Asana up on a glacial lake. That would be yeah. wonderful. Beautiful. So maybe you could be thinking about what what form that sauna could could take. What what shape? I don't know. There's some bench thinking for you. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely a project that I would love to do someday. Is uh, like a backcountry sauna. Right on. Right on. Um, and if you could sauna with anybody in the world, uh, say dead or alive, past, present, uh, who's the first person that pops into your your head? Well, I didn't. I, I think um, the first person that I would want to sweat with today is someone alive I would rather choose is because uh, it's possible. And I really like Wallace Thornhill. He is a um, plasma scientist and he does a lot of research on electricity. And I've been absolutely fascinated with his work and some of the ideas about plasma um, being a really important element that we don't consider um, and also an alternative cosmology to the Big Bang theory. Um, there are a lot of people who think that the Big Bang is not the only um, explanation and Wallace Thornhill and the Thunderbolts project has some really really wonderful um, ideas and if you've never heard of them i just highly recommend you check out the thunderbolts projects and some of the uh ideas in astrophysics that are happening with electricity and electromagnetism yeah and that begs the question would it be a wood-fired or electric sauna stuff? yeah <laughs> absolutely would unfortunately i mean i like talking about electricity but uh there's no way i i don't use electric saunas although i would um if if i had to um, but you cannot compete with the wood sauna. It's just the heat is tremendous and the process is elemental. Um, and, and I think that part of it really has always resonated with me. It's just the actual just starting the fire um, and staying connected with that is really important to me. Yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, <clears throat> as you talk with others that are less familiar with sauna than, than yourself, um, you know, as you encounter people, um, you know, your saunas uh, have a story behind them and are, are unique in, in, in certainly in, in their own ways and stuff. But what do you think is most misunderstood about sauna specifically, um, you know, in, in the Northwest or, you know, in, in people that you encounter? Um, you know, if you, if you could kind of distill it to like, like one thing, what is most misunderstood about sauna? Uh, well, I think the most misunderstood thing that I come into contact with is people only think that it's a hot room. And um, I think that there's really a misunderstanding um, because the cold plunge is so essential to really appreciate a sauna. And I mean, you know better than anyone, but I think that really is in the Northwest the most misunderstood thing is that most people come that don't know sauna, they only expect that it's going to be warm. And then when you encourage them to do the cold plunge, they have to kind of address their own uh, personal volitions. <laughs> yeah, right on. And, and you can't convince everyone, which is okay. I mean, I don't try to convince everyone, but I let them know that it's really important. Yeah, yeah. And even to that, that point um like a baby step for that and you know i wrote an article like uh are you benefiting from the clean rinse after every sauna round and and what, what i as a baby step i really try to encourage this idea of of rinse like you know if you can't take the ice cold water at least like hit the outdoor shower or jump in the lake or or get that rinse going um mm -hmm. and often that's like a a gateway drug, you know, or, or the beginning stages for for an ice cold bath or you know lake plunge. Oh yeah, but you once you do that, you just can't go back. I mean, it's a life changer. You're standing out, you're standing outside. It's freezing cold, and you feel warm. Yeah. And you can't explain that to someone. There's just no words. It sounds mm -hmm. crazy just from our experience of cold. But once you get through that, it it really changes your life. 
Amen. I feel it. I love it. Thank you. Um, and and as you think about, like, is today a sauna day for you, Travis, or? or? No, um, I saunaed uh, yesterday, actually. Um, yeah. And I'm going to do my next sweat on Saturday, probably. Um, yeah. I don't do it every day, but I usually wait for real cold days or uh, maybe once or, or twice a week. About mm -hmm. once to twice a week usually is what I end up doing. Well, today's a sauna day for me, and I actually have the stove on idle right now. I almost want to jump nice. off and throw another wood a log on the fire, but I'm enjoying our chat immensely. As So Saturday is a sauna day, and as, as you think about that day, uh, you know, the anticipation of as it leads up to, you know, firing up the sauna stove, um, you know, uh, checking on the fire, round one, the first cold plunge, you know, uh, your cycles, your rounds. Um, even tucking yourself into bed at night, you know, that whole, that whole process. What's your favorite? What's your favorite moment through a sauna session? I, I think it really comes back to that cold plunge again, is that the moment that you step out of the water and you feel the steam coming off your body, it's just an, another worldly moment. And so because of that, it's, it's, I guess, a bit novel, but I just, that's my favorite part. Lovely. Sauna's getting to be a big deal out in Washington, isn't it? I mean, are more and more people getting into it out there? Yeah, I think more and more people are, you know, um, but it's not super common. It's not um, a part of most people's daily activity or weekly activity. I think the the gym community is probably the people that I find that use sauna the most is that people who have access to it through their gyms. Um, and whenever I get people that have only used a gym sauna and they come to my sauna and I have these much higher temperatures, it, they are always like, I could, it's nothing like what I've experienced. So, you know, it's the saunas that do exist don't necessarily have the same benefits that you and I appreciate so much. So yeah. I'm, I, I think it's still up and coming here um, right on. On, right on. on a large level. You know, yeah. on an average person level. Right on. I, 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 yeah, I feel it. You know, here in Minnesota, you know, sauna has, you know, has been around, like, you know, with the Finnish immigrants coming here and our topography with so many lakes and stuff. It's, it's really, um, there, there really is not really, you could say there's not really a revival. It's always been around. Um, but there is sort of this urban revival and you have, you know, younger, younger folks that may have experienced sauna at like, you know, camp or at grandparents cabin and so so we, we have this familiarity in minnesota um it's certainly not like finland by, sure. by that stretch but it's really interesting to talk with people from all over north america you have great cedar and great climate and great nature and um yeah i think there's a scandinavian history a Nord nordic history to your region um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I would say Minnesota's sure a hotbed, but you're you're probably a lukewarm bed for sauna out there. Sure, yeah, and sweat lodges too are around this area. Mm -hmm. Native American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right on, brother. Well, this is great. I I love having you on sauna talk, Travis. Any any other thoughts or words that? Uh, come well, to I mind? I had a quick question for you, if that's okay. Yeah, man. Yeah, I saw that that golden egg sauna, and I just wanted to to ask you a quick question about what, how that happened. You know, that was a really unique sh building. Um, it, and, yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you asked me about that because I was going to bring that up to you. <clears throat> um, I didn't. I wanted to keep your art separate from that art. The, that That's was. Okay. Um, yeah, that building. design. But but there is some common. I, won't, I hate to even use the word commonality. Um, there, there's some, you know, like interesting common elements of what that project was about in the work you're doing. So thanks for, for bringing that up. I, I had the pleasure to sauna in, in that sauna. It came to nice. Minneapolis. And um, I actually on Sauna Talk, I interviewed the, um, uh, the, the two guys that were behind the, the project. And okay. um, it's, it was quite fascinating. It's very visually appealing, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely, you know, it's round, it's faceted. So those those round curves aren't contiguous, but wow, what a shape. And especially for a sauna, it must work really well. 
Uh, well, I have to be very diplomatic about this. But <laughs> <laughs> see, see uh, well, it, they were Swedish guys that built it. So does that say something? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kind of joking. I'm a little bit joking. But, but see, the, so the, uh, in fairness to the sauna, it, uh, it was deployed in Minneapolis in, a, in the winter, and it was really cold. And there's no insulation in the sauna. And it's oh, okay. A, and this golden egg is quite vertical. I mean, I think it's about 10 feet tall. So you, you climb up into this. Up. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the simple process of heat rising really works against the, sa the sauna. So mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a guy that loves it hot, like you and I, um, I was almost reaching for my spring jacket. And I, I yeah. felt bad <laughs> about, about that. So, but You're anyway. a little too conditioned. Yeah, yeah, and I, I have to be so careful. I want to be very careful because the art is, um, is the, the form is so um, magnificent. Um, sure. And, you know, sometimes the function may, may not go right in hand. How's, yeah. that for, how's that for art diplomacy? Was I okay? So, sounds good. It's a very <laughs> right cool <on>. building. <laughs> it's a very cool, it's very cool. And God love creative saunas, right? I mean, that's the spirit I think of. Of, of your great work and and so please you know keep it up um what else like uh where can people learn a little bit more i'll i'll put some links to the show notes we would love to you know keep up with you on the progress of your writing and your work um uh it, you want to leave us with any thought about your future travis in terms of your you know you have a writing project on the table here uh any any sauna build specifically in your immediate future or um, maybe leave us with a little bit of info like that and, and how people can stay in touch with you. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Um, well, I do have a couple of sauna projects that are in the works. Uh, I have a friend who lives in Asheville, North Carolina and has a little community. They bought property and they've talked to me about building a custom sauna there on a lake. Um, so that's something I'm really hoping to do, um, but it hasn't all aligned. The stars haven't aligned yet. Um, but this spring I might be doing something in Asheville. Um, and then I have another person, a friend who's living in Colorado, who's talking to me about a portable sauna. Um, that's actually a Viking ship design. So that sounds like a pretty cool project also um, that, that might be coming up. And then um, you can learn about all the stuff that's happening for me. I have a website that's the 100 the the number 100 and then the word handed h-a-n-d-e-d -E 100 handed.org and um that you can learn more about the 100 handed ones and you can see some of our other works um and then um yeah then you can keep up to date i'll have the book available probably on a with a online uh version also um, it's going to be a couple months at least until I'm even done the content. So I'm not sure when the book will be out, but I thought it would actually be better to talk to you while the process was happening so that you could be a little bit a part of what is happening and not just the finished product. Um, and then hopefully maybe when I do finish, I will get you a link and, um, and we'll be able to promote the book also. That would be something that would be wonderful. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Um, I do have an Instagram, um, available too. You can check out some of the stuff like on a daily basis and that's at Paradux, P-A-I-R-O-D-U-C-K-S. Um, and that's a pretty good way to, to keep in touch. I try to put pictures up, um, just to share with little woodworking projects, metalworking projects, just things I'm doing, tinkering. Um, so uh yeah that's how you can learn more and um glenn i really appreciate you making this organization and or and uh interviewing all these people it's it's really been super inspirational for me to learn from the the media that you've created and um i think it's really important to recognize that we need as much media that's promoting a healthy lifestyle as we can get right now and um so i really would like to say thank you for for the work that you've done Thank you, sir. That's very kind. And, and it's a labor of love and my pleasure. I, I get to connect with someone like yourself. Um, it's made my day, uh, maybe my week. In a time of Corona, it could be the highlight of my month. <laughs> so thanks, man. And Travis uh, Skinner, uh, uh, yes. state of Washington. 
uh, anglerfish sauna project. Um, just so happy to make this connection with you, brother. I, I, we're kindred spirits on many levels, and you've really. You, I just want to close with from from my side is you've really. I want to emphasize you've really reinforced the the art of sauna building as as a as a creative process and and not a plug and play uh, um, thing you do to get done. It's it's a beautiful journey and and you've such a beautiful example of of that and and I hope others are inspired by your great work. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Be well. And I, I hope you have a a great sweat. Yeah, man. I'm going on the bench right now. All right. <laughs> See you, Travis. Goodbye.